Ricky Dukes, who is the adapter and director of The Changeling, uh, and also the artistic director of Lazarus Theatre. Sarah Duskadir, Duskadir. Uh, who is the dramaturg. Uh, Sam Glossop, who is the sound designer, and Stuart Glover, who is the lighting designer. Am I in this? Do I need to sit down? I'm not, not in it. You're in it now. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna sit down. Um, so let me, uh, so I'll get the ball rolling, and I'll start, of course, as I usually do with Ricky. Um, Ricky, 16 years on, uh, this is, um, Lazarus Theatre is a, a theatre company that specializes in reimagining the classics, and boy, they've done some doozies in the past 16 years since the foundation of the company. But not the changeling before, am I right? Why, mm. why have you chosen to do, do the changeling and do it now? Oh God. Uh, well, there's, there's, uh, oh, there's a list. There's, um, there's a shelf at home in my office at home with all the plays to do. Um, and so it's been on the list for a long time. And then we did Hamlet. Uh, we did a version of Hamlet anyway. Uh, early this year and, um, and and we were sort of well I was sort of craving a play where the characters do stuff rather than talk about doing stuff and then I went to I did a drama school production of Julius Caesar and that's so dewy they just do it I mean there is a bit of thinking but they just do it and I thought god this is really brilliant and then Chris who's the artist director here, sort of the playhouse and I were talking about titles and what we should do and um, and because he really loved our Dr. Faustus that was the year before, he was like, well, let's do another slightly more obscure rather than the big titles. So, and this, there was this and there was another title that was at the top of the list and I said it and he knew the play, he didn't know Dr. Faustus, but when I said the change, he went, I know it, you'll do a great job, do it. So there wasn't anything particularly political or sort of timely about it other than there is a shelf in my office at home with uh, several hundred plays on, you know, in the noise, where you sort of go, oh yeah, that'd be a good one at some point. And so it came out of kind of a pragmatism, but also comes out of a, yeah, what do we as a company want to do? And how do we, you know, so that was it. It wasn't, unfortunately, it wasn't a big thematically sort of, <gasps> I saw a light kind of thing. <laughs> but it was, um, it was like, actually, it's a corker of a play. Um, and um, we're, we're looking in a position now of being here to the place for a few years, that um, the artist director trusts us. Well, he says he does. And, and so when I said it to him, he said, yeah, do it. Brilliant. Um, and it's a great choice. Very, very good play. Um, and especially how you've done it here. Which, for the, those who have seen previous productions and or studied The Changeling, is very different, isn't it? So, Sarah, first of all, tell us what a dramaturg does, and then tell us what's uh, <laughs> basically different between this version that we've seen and the set text. Um, so what does a dramaturg do? Um, I guess um, supports the director and the cast in thinking about research, um, contextualising the play, um, just giving that, um, I guess, the kind of um, original performance context um, mm -hmm. of the play um, and insight into text and, and those sorts of things. Um, and in this version, so the original play has another subplot that we don't see, we have a little few illusions here. Yeah, it, so the, the original play has a main plot, which you've seen, and then a subplot, which is um, set in a madhouse, um, <laughs> and uh, is uh, sort of echoes the, the main plot, um, but it's very different in tone, um, different it's a whole set of other characters, and um, yeah, I think that what this production has done so well is to, I think... Um, really be faithful to the spirit and the purpose of, of that subplot, sometimes known as the Madhouse subplot, without actually staging it. So the songs are sort of providing that, that um, I guess that substitute for what, what the, the full Madhouse plot would be. Um, so it's a, it's a very, it's a different interpretation from, from the text and it cuts a lot of the text, but actually the main plot and the subplot are working together to explore the themes that you see so beautifully explored in this production. Mm -hmm. So um, sexual fidelity, misogyny, um, violence, um, honor, um, service uh, in, in all its lovely meanings. 
Um, so yeah, so so it's very it's a different um, it's a different take text and performance, but that's how performance should yeah, be. Absolutely, and uh, and you also Ricky, you do refer to the the um, the band, the people who do the music, mm. as the patients, which mm. I, I like as well. Um, uh, both Ricky and Sarah also have fantastic notes in the program, which is a nice chunky program, chunky really worth program. Um, getting. So be sure to get that, um, including um, Sarah. Um, refers to, uh, she's talking about the original uh, production, um, there are some really great notes that you include about uh, that original 1622 production that ran at the Phoenix Theatre in Drury Lane, um, and actually how there are similarities that are being Obviously echoed. we didn't see it. No. <laughs> <laughs> that are being Not echoed in this no, very no, no, yeah. yeah. But I want to turn to uh, Sam and uh, Stuart. I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of those points when the actors join us as well. Um, but, okay, so sound, lighting, um, they're so crucial for creating the world of the play. And both of you, by the way, uh, both of these um, theater makers, they are Lazarus alumni, both of you. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so tell us, how do you work with each other and with Ricky and the, and the rest of the company to help create this world? Um, difficult question. Okay. <laughs> Whenever I read a, a script that Ricky sends, because they're not really my Thing, really. I'm a bit of an idiot, so it takes me a long time to figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs> uh, and the reason I work with Lazarus is because they allow you to be very creative in what you can come up with and, and, and taking these plays and doing them in a different way that I find accessible. Um, Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Oh, God. There's a reason why I don't <laughs> act. Um, yeah, I've forgotten what the question was, really. How, how, the, how do you work with Ricky and the other creators uh, to weave sound into helping create this world? Um, or you, if, if you want to go first, Stuart. Um, so like really helpfully, Ricky <laughs> breaks the script yes. down into episodes, like a, so small snippets that can either be duologues or it's normally based around someone's entrance or someone's exit. Mm. Uh, and as a company, well, certainly us two, uh, it's trying to punctuate those moments so that we get a sense of the play moving forwards rather than being... Yeah. So that sort of a rhythm to it that keeps it flowing and we don't get stuck in one place too, too long. Yeah. One of the interesting things I think I found, I don't know about you, uh, with this is that Middleton isn't particularly clear about where things happen. They're either in a corridor or a room, but it's not very specific. Uh, and so trying to create a sense of the fort but it being quite a, a labyrinth, like a, you could be anywhere inside the fort. Claustrophobic and it shifts around yeah. quickly. So it's quite difficult. And I think watching it back, there's things we might do differently to get, give that story a better, it's a clearer. clearer sort of understanding of it. But I think it works. I think it works. Um, and uh, the design, the set designer, Sorsha Corcoran, have I pronounced that correctly? Mm. Sorsha Corcoran, so they couldn't be with us tonight. But um, the table, Ricky, was that your um, idea or working with Sorsha? How did you come up with the table? So Sorsha and I go, uh, spend lots of time just chatting and WhatsApping and we take pictures of things like um, flags in a tree and go, oh, what about this? Or uh, just random images and things. And then we talk a lot and then we get a model out eventually and start modelling. The thing, and, and actually someone, someone said, why is there always a bloody table in your shows? There's always a bloody table. The thing I love it's, about it is... It's it, a different table, though. It, it is always a different table, <laughs> yes, still a table. And the thing I love about them is they provide a sort of destination for the characters, particularly in a three-sided space like this. If there were gangways down there, then it would be a travelling space, where this is a destination space. So when people come in, they have to come in here for a reason rather than, like in Traverse, they can travel through it. See what I mean? And I'd love to gangway down that way. I'd love that way people to one off. But it becomes, come in, come in. Yeah. It becomes, um, um, do you know what? Um, do you, could, uh, I wonder actually, I'm going to be difficult to, because I, I just am wondering if we're going to fit everybody in. Could we get half of you in that behind the creatives and then half of you on this row? So we're all in this kind of bank of seats. Um, and then, fantastic, sorry, Ricky, and I'm going to stand. <laughs> um, actually, I'll sit here. So what, did you finish? So, so, the, so the, the, the big men that um, 
the table does this. It gives us a definition, but it also gives us a structure. So then very quickly you start working rehearsal going, it could be a table, it could be a stage, it could be a gallery. So there's one moment in um, uh, the stage direction says a gallery, as in an upstairs sort of landing that's open to another floor below. And then you go, well, you've great, you've got a structure. So she so Beatrice and Joanna can walk across the structure. So it just it just becomes a bit of a playground really. And then when you've got something like this in the rehearsal room, I think when we first showed you the cast, I think it's Hamish went, or oh, can we go underneath it? And I sort of go, yeah. And that's the, the really exciting thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, that's the exciting thing, it becomes a bit of a jungle gym. Yeah. You know, where you can, and I love that when actors go, can we jump on it, can we open it? And then we found it had these flaps in it, and then things could come out of the flaps. And, and all of a sudden, the, all these possibilities, these theatrical possibilities come up. Mm. And without it, it'd just be a space and we wouldn't know where to stand, whereas this gives us some sort of uh, destination. Fantastic. I love it. You guys have filled up a it's very like nice <laughs> order. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, okay. Right, Here, here's where I'm going to do my best. Okay, so back row. And please, save your applause to the end, or we will be here all night. Uh, Hamish, Miko, Miko, Miko uh, Kira, uh, Milo, Alex, Jamie, uh, Emma, Dane, Colette, Henrietta, and no way, don't tell me, no, 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 don't tell me. Olsen. So welcome company, thank you Cass for joining us. Um, so what I've done so many of these Q&As uh, with Lazarus over the years and including a lot of the people because I think of Lazarus, it's like a family. You are very proudly an ensemble company and every single production is a mix of returnees um, and newcomers that get um, uh, welcomed into the Lazarus way of doing things. So um, now, so tell me, raise your hands, returnees. Lovely, and just to be totally clear, raise your hands, newcomers. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, so returnees, you might have noticed, include Colette and Jamie, who are our devilish um, uh, Beatrice, Joanna, and DeFloris. Um, and I have to just say, I've always wanted to tell you this, cool. you're the reason, well not you alone, but you are one of the reasons that I have fallen, I fell in love with Lazarus, because oh. my first production was seeing you as Henry V. Which is amazing. And I can't even count how many Q and A's you've Um so okay, so um uh I do wanna just say with Jamie and Colette, um you've done many Lazarus productions, but have you done one before? Together before? No. No, yeah. no, we haven't. We've never even met, have we? Yeah. No, <laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> okay. Each other, yeah. So then, how? I mean, the, obviously, the relationship between your characters is critical mm -hmm. to the play. How did you two work on that together? Well, I think I knew a lot about you before coming into it. Mm -hmm. I like I knew you'd done a lot of Lazarus stories, so I knew that he would be kind of committed and a great worker and all those things. So I, I came into it feeling very confident in the dynamic that would be created. And I think it, it was quite instant. I think like we just kind of, I think we, uh, as you settle into the characters, that's when the dynamics started to kind of like pop up and like start to really work. Um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I guess a lot of it's just down on the page as well. And then you just, you just hope that the person you're acting with is also like very generous and open to things that are going on and Colette was. So yeah, just kind of like sitting into what's down on the page and allowing that to kind of breathe and live. That's how we got there. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, although this is the first time I've ever seen Jamie cast as someone unattractive. That's, that was a good <laughs> <laughs> um, Milo, Hi. you you also part of this love triangle, mm -hmm. and you're one of the newcomers. I, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, and I also was really interested in an in a interview the three of you did together. Yeah. And Milo, you were talking about how you're finding working with Lazarus, and in particular, Ricky. You said something that intrigued me and I want to get your take and maybe any other uh, company members. Okay. You said um, that Ricky um, uh, encourages the actors to explore the extremism of their characters early on. W what do you mean by that? And can, uh, Lots of nodding heads, so I want to hear what other people think as well. Yeah, it's, um, I'd say the, the Ricky encourages us to touch the extremities of every word, every line, every moment in the piece. And I guess the philosophy behind this is, and Ricky would, would say this as well, I hope I don't screw this up, mm. but is <laughs> once you sort of know the edges of a thing, then it's, then it's easier to know the center of it. Mm. And 
And um, that's been, this kind of outside in approach has been really useful in work with a lot of the exercises we've done that have been far more bonkers than what you saw tonight. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, and I think it's been really helpful because there's a lot of the characters and situations in this, in this piece and this book is huge. Um, and so that kind of outside in approach has been, it's really free for an actor because it takes everything out of the, well, it takes the onus on us to create character away right from the start. Brilliant. I'm, I'm wondering what the more bonkers version looks like. That would oh, be wow. fun. <laughs> um, Ricky, did you want to add? Or I'm, I'm wondering if any of the other actors who were nodding want to add. Henrietta. Um, Ricky does tend to say during notes to reach the Guinness World Record <laughs> moment of something. So um, of the laughter, of, of a hiccup, of literally anything. And so that's been a helpful note. Um, Anyone else? Anyone else? <clears throat> yeah, no, I think it's also good to get us to that place as well because you can always rein it in if it's too much. Mm. So sometimes it can be too much, but I think actually it's good to push those extremes. And even though we're in a space like this, which feels like it's quite intimate, so therefore you kind of think, maybe I don't have to go as far. Actually, I think it can kind of hit you a bit more if you kind of like push those extremes mm -hmm. um, and really go to that point. So no, mm -hmm. I think it works for the play. Okay. Um, I'm also going to pick on before audience, I'm turning over to you after this. Um, my three uh, singing forensic laboratory detectives in the <laughs> you guys are brilliant. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that was planned. I thought that was planned. Hey, yeah. Miss Miko um, and Kieran, tell us about the singing. Are you having a blast with that? What's the <laughs> so much fun? Yeah, so much fun. Um, you know, it, it was interesting because the I, I, I don't know if everybody in the audience knows a lot about the play, but the songs were meant to sort of, I guess, sort of represent, there's a hospital uh, secondary plot in, in the play, and these songs sort of, in a way, kind of represent that. Yes, um, we, we did touch on that with the creators before you oh, came great, in. Oh, great, Yes, fantastic. but yes, but that's um, good to know. I mean, it's just, it's just fun. Yeah. <laughs> Get the bells of the high heaven. Yeah. yeah, that was the last thing people were expecting as well. Mm -hmm. Like, it's really fun, like, Philippina stands up, <laughs> it's just a natural reaction when I start singing anyway. <laughs> no, it's it's my, my favourite moment. It's because I wasn't sure, because it is so weird. When we were doing rehearsals, the person that was always sat in front of me was our um, assistant director, who's not with us. He's still alive, but Ed was. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he would always giggle, and I was like, great, I've got him. So whenever I've got a member of the audience who hasn't seen it before, I'm like, how are they going to take it? And they always be like, what? Um, <laughs> Okay, audience, how are you feeling? Are you warmed up? Who's got? Now I've got lots of questions. <coughs> Is the rehearsal process. I always think people are amazed by this. How long is rehearsal? It's only three weeks. Mm -hmm. wow. I know, then, right? Oh, <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's actually well, quite common for a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so week one is, well, it was three weeks and a, a day. The first week, sort of, they've got to work out, and we've got to work out how we work together. So that's the ensemble bit. So there's a lot of we do company warm up every day, about 90 minutes or so every day. Well, the start of the process is longer than that, and then it gets a bit shorter. But it's basically everyone working out how each other works, so that we build a sort of language and a sort of communication network before we even get anywhere near the characters. So that is a bit mad doing that in three weeks, because if you think of European ensemble they spend years sometimes. Don't they? Um, so we try and do that because cause I think it makes, well, potentially makes better work, and it's a bit deeper, and it's a little bit more uh, connected and trusted and all that sort of thing. 
and then we start dipping into play. So I think the first week's sort of um, playing, trying things, exploring things. Then lots of text work, like literally what does it mean? So with meaning, I'm not interested in what does it mean in a kind of hypothetical thing. Literally, what's the translation of a word? So just a little clarity with that. Uh, and then we build and build and build, and we traditionally stage very late. So that takes nerves of steel from a cast. <laughs> <laughs> because most actors are used to staging from day one. Or, or some directors call it locking. I didn't call it locking, I call it staging. But we tend to do it, and in fact, I think this time we did it the end of week two into the start of week three. Right. So it's very late. But the reason I sort of, well, one, the reason that happens is because there's so much other things to do. But two, uh, I find that when, I, when you get staging very late in the process, actors' choices are generally the right one first off because it's based on all the work they've already done. Um, and so actually you can stage a play relatively quickly if they already understood what's happening. Whereas when I've been an assistant director on directors who day one start staging, you spend hours over which door to come through. And, and it really doesn't really matter which door they come through. Do you see what I mean? Whereas for the, there's no doors and we just play. So, so they think it builds and builds and builds. And then the balloons didn't come in until Pepper, I think, actually. Like <laughs> so, so it's not like we're not spending weeks playing with balloons. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so entertaining, isn't it, seeing the actors respond as they're like remembering what they were going through in every week. Um, but with the balloons, is every audience as fun as we were tonight? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever done that. The, I'm sure the guy on, on the road with me, he popped it purposely. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> where is that guy? Where is that guy? <laughs> Okay, where are our hands in the audience? Uh, okay, front row, yes. Uh, the is the difference between Mad Men and Fools coming together. As you take the second plot out, how do you define the problem? How do you, how do you find what, sorry? How do you define, how do you explain the changeling? The changeling. Oh, yeah, well, so actually, change. so first of all, what does the changeling actually mean? The, t the actual word, the changeling, what does it mean? <laughs> There. Um, the changeling, uh, the, the official title, the changeling, there's a character in the Madhouse plot, Antonio, who is the changeling, um, and that means sort of madman or fool. Um, but the, the, the thing about the title, the changeling, it's who is the changeling in the play, and you get um, just running through this language the idea of changing and swapping. Um, and uh, really centred around um, Beatrice changing one man for, for another, uh, people sort of commenting on that. So uh, I think the play is really interested in who is the changeling, what is faith, what is fidelity. Mm. Um, so it, it's really open for, for um, discussion, really, I think, who, who the changeling is, even if you take out that character. I did a quick Google search just on the definition of the word the changeling, and it says, have you guys done this? Yeah. It says, yeah. What does it say? Yeah. You don't know what I'm, you, do you know what I'm going to say? Do you say it? Okay. <laughs> that it's a, um, it's an infant stolen by fairies yeah. and replaced yeah. by a fake yeah. baby. Yeah. That's so a lot of the famous ones in Midsummer Stream, the, the child that's starting over and over again. Yeah. 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 I think the changing is everything. All the characters are changing. They all change. Mm -hmm. And so in the first half, Jasperino and Tommaso, uh, are one type of person. In the second half of the play, they're entirely the opposites. Um, and, and actually, it, over time, the creative team and I were just going, actually, we've all, we're all always in a madhouse. Because what is a madhouse? We're all, in, have you turned the TV on? <laughs> yeah, turn yeah. the TV on when you go home and watch news night. We're a madhouse. You know, the stuff that's going on in Gaza and Israel, and then we go, this is mental. And I don't mean in a funny way. I mean as in, oh my God, what the hell is happening? Do you know what I mean? And, and sometimes I think I'm mad. Mm. Uh, I probably am. But I walk around and go, am I mad or is the world I'm in mad? Sometimes I've been in processes, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but sometimes in drama schools I work, I go, am I mad or are they mad? Is this mad? One? And the truth is we're all on a spectrum yep. of madness. What does madness mean? But anyway, going back to the question, the changing for me is uh, they all are the changeling. They have changed, they have catalysts, they have moments where they change. Jasperina in the first half, this cocksure sort of, well, I think he's actually probably quite... Um, Horny dog. Um, yeah, and that, that, but that's actually a performance of masculinity. And then later you find out he's actually mature, you know, uh, and, and things like, and, uh, you know, Tommaso is, is sort of just 
slightly concerned in the first half, later on actually becomes this weirdly becomes Hamlet. I mean, where did it's all that, you know? So, so I think they're all the changeling, and they have changeling moments throughout the play, some more than others. It's okay, we only have a few minutes left. Yeah. Keep your sh answer short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, actually, to, I, I think I really want you to publish your uh, ad adaptations and play texts because they're brilliant, including um, some of your notes in this version. You say, as you just said, um, the play ultimately asks, who is mad? Answer all of us, which mm. is so true. Uh, OK, uh, there was a question over here, uh, front row. Uh, balloon popping man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I want to ask a question about, about the sort of boardroom setting, because we've been making a, a, a play which is um, set of these 17th, 17th century Spain. Um, with castles and honour and lords and, and ladies, and we're projecting that into a, a boardroom sort of boardroom environment. And I want to try and understand the thinking behind that. I mean, beyond the simplistic, I suppose, simplistic metaphor about boardroom politics being a bit like murdering and killing in <laughs> Machiavellian Spain, but beyond that, it was hard to fathom a bit. And I also, in the second half, the plot revolves around um, Beatrice's virginity obviously very important in 17th century Spain, but it doesn't really have much resonance in a, in a boardroom context, which is the boardroom context rather, rather new to that sort of important message. Okay, boardroom, explain yourself <laughs> briefly. <laughs> so we start again, what is the castle? And we only get a tiny bit of information about the castle, but previously it was the headquarters of logistics of the war. That they mentioned very briefly about where how John the Altamero was uh, killed, uh, Altamero's dad, etc. So the castle then going, well, who runs the castle? It's Villandera in our version, <coughs> in our matriarch. So what is the castle, or what has the castle been before? So the whole board table is about really patriarchy and, and the sort of establishment. And that's where decisions get made. And then interestingly, when you start doing some research into medical um, description of madness, it's decided we're in a board meeting. So when you, if you're someone who's been sectioned, you go in and there's a board meeting of doctors who sit around and decide on what scale of mad you are. So the idea was this is sort of communal, and what should happen to you. So a, the idea is this communal space in which 11 characters walk in, someone's gonna die, that's the game, that's the thing that's happening with a, a, a tragedy, a, a, a Japanese tragedy, but also it has then connotations in the other worlds of the play. And what you learn very quickly is that Vim and Darius are actually not in control of the board table at all, actually. So it's a game of Cluedo meets those two worlds, is the idea. Um, Emma, Ricky talked about your character. This character in the original is a male character. She is, yes. <laughs> and uh, so what did you think about <coughs> taking her on instead of him? I thought it was a really interesting challenge on quite a number of levels. Obviously, if you take the original text at the time, um, it would have been like it was written with a patriarchy in mind. Um, putting like a modern twist on that and putting a matriarch in charge instead, in many ways for me, makes what I think some of the issues within the play that are addressed within the context of the play, it makes them actually worse. Um, she behaves abhorrently towards her daughter. And I was really interested in just exploring what this dynamic was between a really powerful woman whose husband has died, uh, presumably, obviously that's, that's the, kind of what I ran with, whose husband has died, she's taken over, she's basically fighting for survival in this very kind of patriarchal world. Um, and I found that the, the, the dynamic with uh, my daughter very interesting to explore from that point of view, this whole conversation. And yes, obviously, you know, we don't talk about virginity, well, not in this country anyway. Um, about virginity in the same way that we would have talked about it in 16th, 17th century Spain. There are many countries in which actually it's still <laughs> pretty fucking relevant. Um, and just to explore, I mean, you know, that's, that's the truth, right? Um, the concept of honor, you know, now we don't have that, but it, it's, it, that's not the case all over the world. Um, and to have a woman, a matriarch, actually in charge of basically negotiating her daughter's honor, her daughter's virginity, her. I thought that that was a really interesting take. It, it changed the dynamic. I think it's a very different play for having a matriarch, a woman, as Vermandera, as it would be having a male as Vermandera. I agree. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for one more audience question. Uh, is it a really good one to end on? Well, let's try. Yeah, yeah let's try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
something easy. I was just curious to hear more about the Lazarus text process because it seems very specific. Oh, uh, blimey, in like five <laughs> seconds. Uh, it's not that radical, it just adheres to punctuation, which uh, sort of all the world of folks will, as in classicists will realise or will know that Shakespeare and Middleton and Epicentry didn't really put punctuation into their text, but my view in the results room is if ac academics have worked the, where the punctuation should go to hit the metre but also the uh, sense of it, and they've spent 500 years sort of doing that, and there's a massive industry in academia working that out, then I'd rather go in a rehearsal room and adhere to that. So essentially our process is based on punctuation rather than the iambic pentameter, mm -hmm. which sometimes I find actors with the iambic, it just doesn't make any sense. Whereas actually because we work in punctuation, and I mean, God, it, we do, a, we do a, a, a workshop of three hours on this, mm -hmm. so I can't do three hours in 10 minutes. Kind of for the workshop. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, essentially it's adhering, and I think you find so much out about the characters and the way that they think, mm. breathe, operate, mm. from how the writer has written it, mm. Uh, mm. that that's where I go for character work rather than trying to add things on the top. Yeah, so that, that's yeah. it, really. The, okay. the Lazarus process is it, the writer's given it us, we have defined it. Mm. Fantastic. So I don't think I heard from Alex and Olson, and I cannot bear to end a Q&A yeah. without having heard from you. So, you guys are both, uh, you play brothers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you're both newcomer, Lazarus newcomers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, Alex first, what are you going to take away from your Lazarus experience? Highlight. And then that's a great question. I think Greg just spoke very much text work. I think that's been a real eye opener. I'm certainly an actor who comes in thinking, what's this character going to be? Who's this going to be? Going to be? And it was great to trust him with this process and say, listen, let's, let's find it in the text. Let's find who this person is. Uh, and then, like go with that, like bring in something with you because it's just you are who you are, so it's going to ha naturally happen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, finding that process, I think, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, um, I think exactly the same. I think uh, what Ricky does with the punctuation and figuring that and being so specific with that, you just, I think he said it before, like you end up breathing like the character, mm -hmm. so you don't need to try and make anything up and you try and find them. They kind of find you if you follow their breath. And I, I, I'd never experienced that before, so yeah. Brilliant. I also want to say, if you aren't already, do follow Lazarus on social media. One of the things I'm loving is your 60-second <laughs> plot challenge. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a big, big, big story that is being told here. Who's won so far, do you think? Who's got the best 60-second? <laughs> okay. Uh, wait, wait. So tell us. Uh, bring it down to 30 seconds. What is it? <laughs> okay. Are you on the clock? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, maybe. Just go. Just go. Okay. Um, Beatrice Joanna is betrothed to Alonso. She decides she doesn't want to marry him because she meets Alcimera in the court. The mother stupidly lets her into the castle. She decides that she wants to Flores to kill Alonso. Uh, he kills him. Uh, she, he then demands her virginity. Uh, she has to give him her virginity, which means she can't then speak with Alcimero. So Diaphanta sleeps with Alcimero. She then gets Diaphanta killed because she needs to take, uh, because she can't bear the shame. And then Alcimero finds out everything, and in the end, they both die and everything is lost. <laughs> <laughs> been the best audience ever on here. <laughs> but, and now, audience, you are officially Lazarus Theatre champions, and particularly champions of the Changeling. So I need you to please go forth, tell everyone to come and see this brilliant production, which is here at Southwark until the 28th of October. Make sure you sign up to find out about their next production, because I can't wait. I'm going to come back. Um, and what else should I tell them, Ricky? Selfies. Anything? What? Selfies. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you know. Okay, right. Oh, you've been to this before, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> so when, uh, after we give them a big clap, I'm going to get us all to budge up. I don't know if we can budge up anymore, but we're going to do some silly social shots. So get on that side, take it, and then you can come and get your selfie with your favorite cast member. Okay, wait, not yet, not yet, not yet. Um, but audience, thank you, and please join me. I'm not going to say everybody's name again, but join me in thanking Lazarus.